I just wanted to give you all a very warm welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Andrea Armeni. I'm the executive director at Transform Finance um, and I'm the co-author with Kurt Lyon of the report on uh, grassroots community engaged uh, investments that hopefully you all are familiar with or have come across if you are joining us today. Uh, and today we'll be specifically looking at uh, the issue or the topic of uh, grassroots community engaged investment in real estate and um, community decision making, community governance, um, with, uh, um, with Adriana and John presented their project. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague Kurt, who will be leading our discussion today. So thank you all for joining and enjoy the presentation. Yeah, thanks, Andrea, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, really excited about this topic today. Um, continuing right along in this discussion series, um, this is our sixth session, I can't believe it, but um, we've been looking forward to this one for a while because uh, the whole uh, area of real estate has really been seeing a lot of uh, innovation in terms of how communities are able to get involved in uh, development of space. Uh, so we're going to explore today some uh, some of those models with our two guests, Adriana and John, uh, and uh, hopefully have a nice discussion about all of this. Um, so, oops, that happens easily. Um, so, uh, our speakers today, we have Adriana Abisade of the Kensington Corridor Trust, uh, that's in Philadelphia, uh, who's pioneering a neighborhood trust model. We're going to hear plenty about uh, both of the models today, the other being the Community Investment Trust, and we have John Haynes from Mercy Corps, uh, who's going to be talking about um, work that they've been doing in East Portland, but also in cities around the country. So we just want to start with a quick uh, recap of what we mean by grassroots community engaged investment. Um, so what we really mean by that is the process of investing with uh, input, decision-making power, and ownership from grassroots stakeholders. And in that case, grassroots stakeholders can be uh, residents of a given community, nonprofit organizations, or other kind of neighborhood institutions. Um, in some cases, it's larger, more regional groups who kind of have deeper connections with those communities. Um, but basically, not investors making decisions about investments. Um, that's been our whole area of inquiry and the, the centerpiece to all of these discussions, um, as well as the report that we put out earlier this year. Um, so with that, uh, we're really excited to get to uh, real estate because um, it's important be to think about uh, GCEI, as we call it, um, as kind of a lens that can be applied across any investment. Really, any investment can be grassroots community engaged investment. Um, it's just a matter of how power and decision making are thought of in the process of making it. Um, so, enterprise investment, community capital funds, uh, which is actually our next uh, session topic, um, that's been a really um, promising and uh, popular area of investigation. So, how can we fund? entrepreneurs, in particular entrepreneurs of color who experience a big capital gap. Um, communities can decide what kind of businesses to invest in um, and all of that. We've seen a bunch of that uh, conversation in our discussion series so far. Um, on the flip side, there's also this whole area of housing and commercial real estate um, that also can be done in this kind of community controlled and community governed way. Um, and that's really important uh, for lots of reasons. Um, and there's a lot of interest in this right now, uh, given the prominence and importance of housing insecurity uh, in this country, uh, not even just after COVID, which really highlighted a lot of those issues, but before folks have really been uh, struggling with displacement, gentrification, wealth extraction from communities. And a lot of that happens through uh, real estate and land. So. Uh, thinking of models where communities can take ownership over land, can invest in it, participate in that wealth building, can control the use of the space and prevent outsiders from taking that and uh, benefiting off of their own displacement. That's been a real area of interest uh, for folks on the ground, community organizers, but also working with uh, traditional community development institutions like 
uh, CDCs, uh, CDFIs, um, other kinds of neighborhood investors, community foundations. Um, there's definitely been a lot of long history of this work. Um, community land trusts, a lot of folks are familiar with, uh, housing cooperatives and various forms of uh, shared ownership over housing. Um, you know, there's definitely a deep rooted history, um, but a lot of these models, and especially today, we're going to be talking about two different trust based models um, are kind of trying to capture some of that ethos and create broad participation amongst the community in uh, the investment over land and how that land is being used. Um, so it's important to kind of make those connections as we go, Hopefully, we'll be able to cover some of the nuances there and some of the, the connections. Um, I definitely want to also mention that while we have two amazing speakers today, Adriana and John, who are pioneering their own models, there's definitely a lot of other projects to check out out there. Some of those are featured in our report um, that are kind of focusing on real estate. Just a couple off the top, downtown Crenshaw is doing a um, really, really um, impressive campaign to uh, purchase and repossess a shopping mall in Los Angeles. Um, a couple sessions ago, we had the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, which is doing community investment in housing uh, in the East Bay. Um, just a couple of uh, real estate oriented models that definitely, uh, you know, if we had multi, uh, multi session series on real estate, we'd be having those folks in as well. Um, and then the last point that I just want to bring up to is this increasing focus on commercial real estate, not just residential housing. Um, I think that's really important to kind of like track the development um, and both of the projects we're going to be discussing today um, are kind of working in that area. So with that, I definitely want to pass it over to the folks who are doing this work. Um, we're going to start with Adriana uh, from Kensington Corridor Trust. Um, take it away. Thank you so much, Kurt, and thank you, Andrea, Tambien, uh, for the invitation. Excited to be here with all of you and to share space with John today talking about um, the similarities and differences in our models. Again, I'm Adriana Bisa, the Executive Director of the Kensington Corridor Trust. Uh, what we are doing is building a neighborhood trust model in the Kensington neighborhood of Philadelphia. Uh, in what I would say before I jump into my deck that is at the premise of our work is really um, centralizing power in that neighborhood space, right? So in a very um, centralized geographic location and really ensuring that the folks who are within that space are the power holders and the decision makers. Uh, Kurt, if you could switch slides for me, please. Thank you. Uh, so we are here because we are trying to really figure out a way in which we can close some gaps that exist within the Kensington neighborhood and in doing so identify ways to close similar gaps in other neighborhoods across the US. So Kensington is a space that is low uh, income, predominantly black and brown, historically disinvested in, um, tons of vacancy and blight, both on the commercial and residential fronts, and uh, is a community that has, you know, in, in addition to high poverty, high unemployment rates, um, poor health outcomes, et cetera. And so our organization was formed uh, back in early 2019 by four partner organizations that were already working in this space after they picked up an article from the Social Stanford Innovation Review Journal written by Joe Margulies at Cornell University Law School. Um, that really put into theory what a neighborhood trust model could be. Um, so what it would look like to have centralized and localized governance, what it would look like to have assets held in the common and collective space versus continuing to have assets be held in the traditional real estate capital market as we all kind of know it in the MLS um, and them constantly be trading and that capital being extracted from the neighborhood. Kurt, next slide, please. And so our goal is to acquire commercial and mixed use real estate on Kensington Avenue uh, and take it off of the market, place it into a trust for the neighborhood to directly govern and control. Uh, and that is doing two things. One, it is protecting and preserving long-term affordability for the folks who live in Kensington today in addition to protecting and preserving long-term control and governance over those assets. So as I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, kind of the widespread gentrification that's hitting these urban environments, Philadelphia is no exclusion. Um, there are two neighborhoods that are actually pressing upon the Kensington neighborhood that are already experiencing and have been experiencing gentrification for some time. And Kensington is just kind of the natural next landing spot. Um, earlier this year in May of 2021, 
a report was put out by eConsult Solutions, which is a local consulting firm in Philadelphia, highlighting that Kensington, which again is one of the lowest income communities um, in Philadelphia right now, was the number one community for new permits for construction and rehab during COVID. And um, so it just really highlights like the places where you think development's not happening, it's actually the place where it is happening. And it's oftentimes happening by outside extractive capital. Uh, Kurt, next slide, please. So the trust was formed, uh, and as I said, initially the first governing board was from those four partners. And so, uh, and I'm sorry, the slide looks a tinge cut off, but in 2019, they came together. In 2020, they formalized their board. Uh, and once that board was formalized, uh, the founding members who were all essentially outsiders, but who had been working very actively in this neighborhood, in the Kensington neighborhood, were the power holders. They were the ones who were making the decisions. They were the ones who were, um, you know, really attracting the capital in and making the decisions around what was going to be acquired and how the organization's model was going to be built out over time. And so in 2020, uh, the organization had some really deep and meaningful conversations about, you know, who benefits when the neighborhood changes, where does power lie, how can control and power be ceded to a neighborhood. And we decided to undergo a governance transition in which the neighborhood became the power holders and the uh, initial board members and the founding members rolled off of the construct, rolled off of the board of directors. Uh, so we are still in that process of transition currently, which will be completed in September. During this time, though, we have begun doing acquisitions and tons of engagement with residents and business owners to better understand, you know, one, where do folks feel like there are needs for um, organizing and um, power holding? And then two, where are there ways in which we can advocate um, both as a model, but also more specifically around access to resources and that collective voice making that this model has the potential to do. Next slide, please. This next slide is just um, kind of highlighting where we are right now. So right now we are currently in a neighborhood held um, majority board structure. The four folks that you see across the bottom right-ish part of the screen under the little dots, uh, those are part of our founding member base and they are the ones who are actually gonna be rolling off of the construct in September. Um, there's a potential that two of them may stay on as uh, invited by the board. So the organization um, has given space within our board construct for residents and board members uh, to invite, I'm sorry, for residents and small business owners that are on the board to invite non-residents and non-board, non-business owners to the construct um, as long as they are mission and value aligned. So Esperanza Health Center, which is the FQHC in our neighborhood, um, will likely be invited to remain on uh, after we undergo that next transition. Kurt, next slide, please. I uh, just want to give kind of an update regarding the space. So we are a 1.4 mile long corridor in that there are 627 assets. We are currently focused on three blocks that house 178 assets. And so just in terms of scale, when we are talking about where we are trying to acquire and the density, um, our average square foot for the building is 2,200 square feet. And that's including the commercial and the residy together. Um, that's probably it for that slide. Next slide, sir. Uh, we do have some lofty goals uh, right now. What we are in the process of doing is trying to raise our first $20 million in order to be able to acquire about 60 assets and bring them online. Uh, we are taking in different types of assets to diversify our portfolio. So we're taking in commercial mixed use assets. We're taking in vacant lots. Um, and then we're taking on, I'm sorry. So the commercial mixed use assets for rehab, we're taking in vacant lots. And then we're also taking in assets for from private developers that would otherwise exit to another private developer so that it lands in the control in the hands of the neighborhood. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, so this is my last slide, but I just wanted to say, you know, as we've been building the construct, the main thing for us has really been the identification of power, right? Where does power lie? Who's making decisions? Who has the control? Um, and is that being shared in the collective? Is it being um, really representative of the folks that will be impacted by this work long-term? Right, the neighborhood trust model is really trying to decommodify these assets in perpetuity. This is intended to be an intergenerational stewardship model. And so in that process, how do we prioritize and elevate you know, in, in perpetuity, right, for the longevity, the ability for this neighborhood to continually govern and continually have the ability to not only decide what is being protected and how it's being developed, but most importantly, how it's being reactivated and utilized for the benefit of the neighborhood. And again, really centralized around how do we reduce extraction and how do we prioritize the local solidarity economy that can exist within Kensington? Thank you so much.
Thanks, Adriana. Um, we're going to go to John in just a moment, but I just wanted to echo uh, what Andrea had posted in the chat uh, for folks to be thinking of questions. Um, feel free to put them in now and we'll get to them um, right after these presentations and we'll have a nice discussion about it. Um, so yeah, feel free to keep those coming. Um, John, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's always great to be with Adriana and, and our friends in Philadelphia, um, two highly compatible models. Um, let me start by just taking us back um, several years and how we started um, researching this and building the model using a human-centered design. Um, here's some of our early investors right here, um, all of which have stuck with it now um, nearly four years into, into creating the Community Investment Trust. So we spent time in the neighborhood. This is the poor census tract in, in Oregon, highly diverse, a landing pad for displaced uh, black community, and uh, 70 languages spoken at the nearby high school. Um, four zip codes, roughly 140 to 185,000 people. A census numbers just came out this week. Um, but we really spent time talking with the people. It really started with a people, place, a property, and developing a product. People told us that they were periodically saving. Um, when we went to renters, we were focusing on renters. This is a high density rental area, um, highest poverty census tract in the state. Uh, talk to people about what's missing in the neighborhood. What would they like? Do they feel involved in, in the changes happening? A gentrifying neighborhood, people moving in, affordable homes. Um, that's changed in the period during this investment. And people said they're saving, they're not investing. Why aren't you investing? Well, we only have a modest amount of money and we don't understand investing. That's for other people. And I postulated a couple buildings uh, and their eyes lit up, say, how could we possibly own a, a building in the neighborhood like that? And I said, I don't know, but let's figure it out. So it took us some time. Let's go to the next slide there, um, Kurt. Um, the product is essentially these five, six components. It's commercial real estate. That's what people are motivated in, in owning commercial retail. And we want to test out the synergy between the ownership and how well the businesses in a, in a commercial strip mall did. Um, four zip codes, again, a contained environment for the investors to be proximate to their investment. Uh, affordable investments at 10, 25, 50, or 100, no more. People sell their investments back into a pool. We registered a, a C corporation in the state of Oregon and issued 45,000 shares initially at $10 a share. Uh, the key magic is the investor protection and liquidity. We did that through a direct pay letter credit that allowed us to do a security offering to unaccredited or low income investors. The investors get a dividend annually based upon the performance of the building. That's averaged 9% um, now for three rounds of dividends and long-term share price change. Their long-term return when they cash out is based upon the pay down of debt and then a calculation on the increase of, of value. And that's gone from $10 to uh, $17.05 at the end of, of uh, this calendar year, this last calendar year. And then a key thing people had asked for is this moving from owing to owning class. So we designed a peer-led class that uh, I see my colleague Elena is, is leading those facilitating classes. And we, we do those in multiple languages, again, to connect to people and um, inform them about what they're doing um, and their plans, budgeting, goal setting, their relationship with money. Uh, Okay, next one. What we're doing now is we're, we're looking to replicate around the country through coaching cities that can lead and start their own CIT. And that, that goes through this process of really embedding the capacity and understanding of the CIT model into the cities. And it's generally, it's a 10 step, but it takes uh, 12, 14 weeks to run through all of these. And um, we've, um, if you want to see the, the contents of this and other resources, please go to investcit.com uh, and it explains a lot of that things that I'm not getting to here. Uh, let's go to the next one. Let me tell you about the property itself. We bought it for 1.2 million. It's worth 2.1 million today. Uh, 27 to 30 tenants, um, very much oriented towards what the people said they wanted, um, a range from nonprofits to for-profit, hair salon, um, tax preparers in multiple languages, 
um, 100% lease. It was built in 1962. We bought it out of foreclosure and fixed it up. Um, very diverse, activated space um, that was very resilient during COVID. I think largely because we had the mix of tenants included nonprofit tenants, uh, in most cases had grant money to support their, um, their lease payments. And they, they were very key in delivering services during COVID to their communities. All right. Next one there. Let me talk about impact. That's the key thing that, uh, that we're tracking is, is does it meet the investors' desires and needs? And 98% of the investors, once they invested, stuck with it and reinvest every year. So super committed. Um, I think partly because of certainly the financial returns have been very good, um, but also they feel um, more connected to the community and it activates their voice. 68% uh, report that they're voting when they didn't on a regular basis when they didn't before. And even during COVID, they're activating their voice in the community and talking about the things that they care about, traffic safety, gun violence, um, just general um, homelessness and other issues are high on, on the list of concerns that people are, are being more engaged in, the, in, in their neighborhood as a result of being an investor. When we ask them why, you know, why are you more active? Why are you voting now when you didn't before? They'd say, because I'm an owner. Ownership matters. Um, the tenants report uh, more activity, the building safer, more active space. Um, you know, with roughly 200 and mid 200 investor families involved, it's hard for them to track, especially um, this last year, how much extra activity they're getting from the investors themselves. But uh, overall, we track it on tenant success, family success, and community health and engagement. Okay, one more. So our progress, again, has been a, a little bit repetitive here, so I won't. There's the demographics there. We're touching who we want to touch, first-time investors, uh, more women than men. Uh, they're considering it a household investment, lower income, and 49% um, in this neighborhood were, um, of our investors were born outside the US. Very often, it's people's first investment ever in anything. Um, and again, focused mostly on renters. The investment is open to anybody that takes the course and commits the investment. Um, but uh, given the nature of how it's designed, I think we're, we're touching who we want to touch um, most significantly. Okay. Uh, some of our lessons learned, um, and then I want to talk very briefly about governance since that's, that's key to this conversation, is that uh, getting the right bank and the right property are key and capitalizing it relative to what the community intentions are, um, which may include some grant funding at the base of the, the capital stack. In our case, we didn't use any grant money. It's all been impact investor um, capital shift of 450,000. It's basically an equity shift of that 450 the, the investors buy out every month. Um, building trust is key when you're dealing with communities that uh, are new to the United States and, and, you know, and, and small um, in some cases, um, Burmese, Eritrean, et cetera, you need to find and we've found community leaders, leaders within the, their own tight community um, to become an investor and to facilitate the classes. We, we pay them $25 an hour to facilitate the owning to owning class. And then, you know, just cultivating a community ecosystem that spurs more activity to the building, more connections, events to the building, and activates um, a safe, you know, engaged, diverse space is really key to, I think, what in, induces investors to, to join. Um, lastly, let me pop up this. We're in the process now. Go ahead, Kurt. Let's move one more. Um, here's just some of the attributes I think that that make the CIT compatible and and relevant to all sorts of different efforts in communities, from neighborhood trust to affordable housing co-ops, et cetera. We're seeing a lot of diverse ranges of projects around the country. Um, now, in terms of governance, we're very much like like the Kensington Quarter in, in that we're shifting from a expert-led board to start. We didn't have investors and we didn't know how this would go, but it's going well. So even during COVID, we've started shifting the board to be community-led. Our new board president is an investor and a class facilitator. And we're building a training package for the, invest, for the investors and a bench to build, not throwing people into managing, you know, being thrown into the deep end of the pool, but really coaching a cohort to become the next leaders 
of, of this uh, C corporation. And we intend to hand it entirely over, over to the investors in the community uh, within the next year, year and a half. Now, where we're going now, just uh, in terms of scale, the cities we've worked with in the last year, are we charge 25,000 for the feasibility study. That tends to be paid by either a bank or a local community foundation. And we find that gets a more engaged um, group um, to the table. And it also allows a funder to step in and realize that these don't run themselves, that there needs to be some support for the operations of each CIT. We've done feasibility studies in Colorado, in order, Colorado Springs, Atlanta, Kansas City, Omaha. Kresge funded us in Memphis, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and, and Fresno. And then we just wrapped up um, Albany. We're working with uh, St. Louis and Baltimore. And then in the queue is Seattle and Phoenix and a couple others. Um, the the plug-in platform that we're offering once they engage in a CIT, really the key one is, is some guidance on the legal um, security exemption. And that's an old 1933 securities exemption that nobody's ever used until we found some smart attorneys to guide us to do that. Um, but uh, also the investor portal. So nobody touches cash. It all goes through a secure stock offering agent, um, stock offering agent and transfer agent. That's the reporting and customer service for the investors. Okay, I think I'll try to keep to time there. There's just a few pictures to give you a sense of, of how it activates the space. We had a planting event and greenscaping that reduced our stormwater bill by $500 a month. So that's $6,000 um, that goes directly into the, into the bottom line that supports dividends. And then we've, you know, dance events, art events, all sorts of safety, wellness, um, health related events and vaccinations we've had at the property. Okay, Kurt, that was quick. Thank you. That was great, John. Yeah, thanks for uh, going through so much, uh, both you and uh, Adriana. There's uh, a lot of good stuff there. Um, so there's a lot of questions coming in the chat. Uh, thanks everyone for um, being so active here. I'm trying to kind of synthesize a couple of them so we can address as many as possible. Um, there's definitely a lot of interest on this um, investment piece, um, particularly around the, the, the way it can work for community investors, but also what kinds of institutional investors are interested in these projects. We'll definitely get to that. Um, but first, I wanted to ask maybe like a dual question um, for both of you, kind of uh, tailored to, to the different models that we're discussing here. So um, in the chat, Matt asked a question for Adriana in how your model prevents displacement. Um, I think it would be interesting to um, address that directly, and in particular, how the neighborhood trust model might be different from um, the kind of usual uh, CDC uh, model for, for uh, land acquisition. And then on the flip side, uh, for John, uh, there's a question from Ruby, I think, um, in terms of how the community investment piece uh, might actually uh, tie into preventing displacement um, in and of itself. So if you could address that. Uh, we'll start with Adriana and then John, you can uh, tackle the next question. You got it. Uh, so the first question was around tackling displacement. The second question was around how we differ from the CDC. Uh, so in terms of tackling displacement, the way that we see it is gentrification is coming irregardless of what KCT does or any other player kind of in this neighborhood that's trying to preserve affordability over time here. And so what we wanna do is just preserve and protect as much as we can, right? And so within that larger footprint, if we can grab hold of a significant amount of assets, we can preserve affordability on those assets so that as other areas of the neighborhood gentrify, and property taxes go up and you know rents that are increasing, right? So the way that we look at it right now in terms of gentrification specifically in displacement, what you see happening on the ground right now actually started happening five years ago. And so the fact that you know Kensington is the number one highest neighborhood for permit pools during COVID, that actually was something that built up to, right? It's not like overnight during COVID, everybody was like, ooh, let's go to Kensington. No, like this has already been going on for some time and the tools just weren't there in place to preserve and protect and so that's kind of where the neighborhood trust was born out of that process. We already have, um, you know, private developers that have come into the neighborhood that have converted, you know, old abandoned buildings over to highest and best use and are attracting folks who do not live in this neighborhood um, and neither, you know, racially, demographically, nor socioeconomically, 
representative of the folks who have lived here historically. And so our goal in, in tackling gentrification and displacement head on is to ensure that there's something that is preserved so that the folks who live here today can live here in the future and moving forward. Regarding the CDC piece, um, so I would say the primary distinction between the KCT construct of the neighborhood trust and a traditional CDC, so a traditional community development corporation, um, is the ability to release assets so easily. So a nonprofit construct can take on commercial or residential you know, assets at any time, and the board of today, tomorrow, 20 years from now, can vote at any given time and say, we want to dispose of these assets for whatever X reason. Within the neighborhood trust model, because it is being built as a perpetual holding and as a permanent decommodification, there is only one allowable exit. And that allowable exit is for long-term commercial tenants to purchase and own their own spaces. What we don't want the neighborhood trust model to do is to become an inhibitor to intergenerational wealth building. And so that was the single exit that was identified um, thus far by the neighborhood for assets to leave the trust at some future moment. So that's the prime distinction I would say, it's just like that ability to hold assets in perpetuity to preserve their um, affordability over a significant period of time intergenerationally. Yeah, that is so excellent. Um, I'm really excited to see the opportunity to put a community investment trust into a mixed income neighborhood trust or a perpetual purpose trust or something like what you're doing in Philadelphia. I think we'll see that happen probably pretty soon. Um, with respect to displacement, um, you know, I completely agree, um, but you can't, you can't stop on a large scale gentrification if people are moving in. I mean, in Portland, my gosh, you can't imagine how many people keep, like I did, came down the Oregon Trail and love the proximity to uh, mountains, blueberries, salmon, um, and the coast and rivers. So you can't blame people for moving here, but it's driven housing prices up continually. Um, so we make the case that let's let renters and people that don't have um, access to that ownership class a stake in the upside and not be pushed out and pushed down and pushed out. Uh, we are by intention, by design, and our bylaws are built around supporting the affordability of the, the tenant space in this building. So it's 29,000 square feet. And based upon how we purchased it and governing um, models relative to that, we're not seeking um, by design and by legal structure um, and by culture, we're not seeking to get the highest rent rates out of this building, but to maintain existing affordability and the increase is only uh, a maximum of 3% a year. And we encourage long-term leases. Yeah, sorry, Kurt, can I just jump back in real fast to something that John said? So. I should also mention that the neighborhood trust model was built very deeply and intentionally with the thought that in the future, a direct investment model could be incorporated into it. So it's not excluded um, or unable to kind of transition or evolve in that way. Uh, the market that exists within Kensington currently is so depressed in terms of the ability to bring an asset back online and the subsidy that is required to do that, that the direct investment just didn't make sense at this time. But our goal is to really move assets forward. And then as gentrification is happening around us, those assets will gain value, but still be held perpetually. And we can then build in that um, direct investment component where there are direct dividends to the folks who are living in this neighborhood and doing business there. Great. Oh, John, were you gonna jump in there? No, I'm just seeing a lot of questions that I can answer quickly, but I'll follow your guidance, Kurt, so we don't get off track. Yeah, I have a, I have a bit of a plan, so hopefully we'll get to, to all of these. Um, I think, Jumping off of that, um, that uh, issue of displacement, how these models uh, can do that, I think there's, there's a bunch of questions around governance, um, and then afterwards we can touch on um, some of the investment questions. But I think this is really core to you know, how Transformer Finance comes to this work and how um, the governance components really keeps these projects uh, to the core of what they're doing and keeping that mission center, centered and building power in the communities that they're working with. So um, Benita asks, um, does it have to be a stakeholder from the neighborhood that starts these projects or can it be someone from the broader community from the outside? Um, and we also had just had a question come in from Richard talking about how uh, you can elect and hold accountable representatives from the community on the boards. Um, so I know that each of you kind of have different stories and how you've gotten to where you are with governance. So I'm curious um, if you tackle those issues of accountability and initiation, you know, how do you balance uh, 
projects that are multi-stakeholder in, in the origin um, and maintain that community control. You, you want me to jump? I'll jump in, John, real quick. Okay. Uh, so in terms of the external stakeholder piece, so I will say, I think just a learning, right? And John, that was a great slide. I feel like I need to make one of those for us. We have so many learnings. Um, mm -hmm. One of the learnings that we've had is just that if this had come directly from the neighborhood, I think not only A, would it have moved along faster? I think B, um, it wouldn't have had like this uptick period that existed in like, what is a neighborhood trust? Why does this neighborhood need this? You know, how is this going to benefit us? And so I, I would urge communities and neighborhoods that are exploring this to really try to get it from the groundswell, right? Like we really see, again, the neighborhood trust model as a power building tool. Real estate is just the, the tool, the, the, the vehicle rather for that work, right? Because there's very clear linkages between real estate uh, ownership and asset and wealth building. And so, but this is all about power. And so when we're thinking about that power, you know, if, if I walked up to you tomorrow, you know, X person in power and I said, Hey, it would be really great if you just relinquish all of this control you've had so that somebody else could come in and take power. And they may not have the expertise that you have. They might not have the, the dollar and the bank roll behind them, but they're from here and they reflect what's happening and they're going to be impacted by this work. Those are difficult conversations to have. And that's what happened at KCT, right? Is we had to sit and do a really deep analysis of who was representing this trust and who was making decisions on behalf of this neighborhood. And I think had it come just directly from the neighborhood, we would have never had to deal with that and have those conversations and like set up plans for how we're phasing and seeding power. Um, so I think, you know, there's that piece of it. What was your second question, Kurt, around? Oh, accountability. Yes. So um, actually, funny enough that you, someone I think used the word voting. So uh, KCT right now, we are a majority uh, neighborhood led board, but we are in the process of hopefully identifying a consultant to support us in 2022 to explore participatory democracy style governance where the neighborhood directly elects the folks at the power table versus them just being designated kind of like any other board of directors would be, which is where we are currently. So, you know, I run into a resident or I run into a business owner and I'm like, oh, this person has this skill set that I think makes sense. Or this person brings this lens that I think makes sense. And then we, you know, have conversations and we talk about governance and what it means and we invite them onto the board. Ideally, we would move to a place where this gets as deeply entrenched in neighborhood power as it can be. And for us, we're thinking that that looks like uh, direct elections to that power construct. So we will be exploring that and hopefully implement something uh, late 2022, early 2023, if I had to guess. Yeah, this is really, really difficult work to shift it to community-led and community power without, you know, losing the original intention. Um, and, you know, the answers are pretty slim out there nationally. There's some good examples here and there, and we're trying to pick and choose from those and build it. But number one, you know, we do an annual meeting every year and continual outreach and feedback and surveys, et cetera, um, to, to get the pulse of our investors. But shifting it to investor control in the community is is imperative for us, but to do that with training. And we're looking at doing um, the shift to a number of you know, new board members, but then to have a bench, um, a cohort of ex officio non-voting that would come in as a group, maybe three people that would monitor and be part of the board, but not vote and build kind of a cohort of them to take over the role in, in a cycle. Um, and then our role, um, as CIT services, it's an LLC that's part of single member LLC of Mercy Corps, um, is, acts as advisors to the board. And then we can raise money independently, grant money to support unusual costs like the audit, um, the classes themselves, the audit that we get every year, um, and appraisal every year, um, DNO insurance for the, uh, for the board members, and some of these costs that wouldn't be supported by um, the operations of the business that, that are unusual to the model. Great, thanks both. Um, and thanks folks for continuing to, to punch in these questions here. Um, I wanted to address a, a big open question. I believe it was from uh, Tom on the investment side. So thinking about institutional partners who would be interested in funding these projects, have funded your projects. Um, what have you learned in working uh, with uh, investors and funders in terms of how they're viewing this? Um, 
And I also wanted to open it up to anyone who has funded or invested in projects, real estate projects that have this community ownership piece. I know there's some funders and investors in the audience. So uh, feel free to raise your hand and we can um, also have like an audience uh, participation in this front. But um, I want to start with our speakers here um, from your side. Um, yeah, who, who's really interested in supporting your work? I'll, I'll go quick on this one. You usually answer so well that I have less to say. So I'll, I'll do this one first. Uh, I'll just tell the story that when this was conceptual, um, for us a decade ago, I went to the two big funders in Portland and I won't name their names, but uh, went to them simultaneously and put forth the vision. And they both came back to me. They clearly talked with each other and should and said, you know, John, this is uh, too complicated. There's too many moving parts and nobody's done it before. So, you know, we're going to take a pass. And, you know, I took my old math equation from sixth grade that two negatives make a positive. And I said, you know, we're going to do this. Um, because they're wrong. Um, well, both of them are supportive of us now. And I think, you know, for the downside of COVID and then the reawakening from George Floyd in Minneapolis, um, all the funders are now paying attention to the racial wealth gap, the wealth gap in general, um, the vulnerability of the poor, you know, the, uh, the labor share of, of income has progressively dropped in the last 20 years to the point at which, you know, as we all know, the top 1% make 60 to 70% of their income off investing. And there's just a, a massive bubble at the bottom and middle of the US economy that does not have access to a range of long-term family building assets. So I think everybody, including the big banks now have woken up to the opportunity to, uh, to do community reinvestment in a new re revitalized way. I will echo John. So, <laughs> Folks say they want innovation, right? Like you talk to funders or you're reading the press and it's like, we want BIPOC led organizations that are supporting BIPOC communities that are low income and we want innovative ideas. The answer is it's not true. That's not actually what they want. They want the safe bet, right? And things like CIT and KCT, we are risky investments because we're in historically black and brown, low income neighborhoods testing out models that no one has ever built before. Why? Because we are combating directly what our economy has said is the best version of capitalism or the best way to build wealth. And this isn't that, right? This is about collective wealth building. This is about a neighborhood regarnering its assets and taking control of what it should have been benefiting from the whole time. But well, because we don't see it that way in our, in our communities and in our country, this is like a radical idea. Well, let me tell you, there's so much to be benefited from by investing in things like KCT. And so it's just been really challenging for us to get some of those initial dollars in. We've had support from both national funders and local funders, but definitely not at the scale and the pace in which we can keep up with private developers, right? Like when I'm on the AV and I'm looking at buildings, I'm oftentimes followed by a private developer that's from out of state. Uh, what's today? Today's Thursday, Tuesday morning. I went to go look at a 11,000 square foot building that just came up for sale on the AV, dilapidated, could be a great CMX2 space, right? So commercial and mix um, and residential up top. Literally, we did our 30 minute walkthrough with members of my board who are residents of the neighborhood, trying to evaluate like, is this a good fit? You know, can we come up with the capital? What would it take to bring this building online? Can we ensure the affordability on the asset? And right behind us walks in a developer from New York who has the money in his pocket. So like, if he wants to buy it, he will. And it just makes it very, it, makes, it frustrates me. That's not obvious in my tone. But it also is just really irritating because it's like, why do I have to constantly prove that what I am building deserves the risk taking that is required to preserve and conserve for a neighborhood that has been abused, disinvested in, and distracted from, extracted from, I'm sorry, for so long when, you know, a million dollars to them is probably like chump change in my pocket. And so it's just, it's, it's been very, very challenging. And I will also say that as a brown woman leading this organization, I love having conversations with folks who are like, we really want to fund black and brown orgs. I'm like, well, great, that's me. <laughs> you know, like I I'm your person. And then it's like, oh, we're going to explore other things. And it's like, okay, well, I you want innovation? Oh no, you don't want innovation. Oh, you want black and brown lead? Oh, you don't want black and brown lead. So tell me what you do want so that I can then get your investment so that we can move forward. Um, and Kurt, I'm going to double dip because I saw somebody ask the question about how we fund the model. So I, I don't know if you were getting there, but 
So what we do is we take in PRI dollars and MAI and MRI dollars from foundations. So program related investments, mission aligned investments, mission related investments. Uh, foundations have endowments and they have funds on hand that they have to disperse each year, depending on where the funds are coming from, depends on what it's called, but it's essentially all the same thing, which is low interest patient capital. So all of our debt sits below 2%, between zero and two. All of our terms sit between 10 and 15 years. And they're all amortized over 30. I have no interest periods and low interest periods, I'm sorry, and interest only periods on the front ends of those terms that give me the runway to be able to execute the projects and get them online. Um, so that's how we fund the model. We also take in grants and subsidy just like any other nonprofit construct. Great, and John, if you also wanna share um, your funding stream, and especially as it relates to KCTs, if you're kind of looking at different funding sources or if it's looking pretty similar on your end. Yeah, I, for, for the capitalization for the project itself, for the building was through two impact investors, uh, a couple, and they put the money in separately at 4% unsecured um, and obviously subordinated to the, the bank debt, um, patient capital at 4% with no term on it. We just paid them off uh, um, two weeks ago. Um, and now, and then Mercy Corps put in the other half and we're the more deeply subordinated lender. And so that means that the, uh, the community of investors have, have paid off um, 230,000 of the original 450 and then our 220,000 is what's going to get chipped away with monthly as you know roughly 240 investors are making i think on average now it's been about half during covid we've had people sign up during covid during classified zoom um, it was about average investment about 80 dollars so on the higher end and it's been 40 um, during this year um, so i think it's probably around 50 times 200 and something a month that's paying down the debt um, operating costs are the, the bigger one. Um, mostly local foundations, banks have been very good. And now we're talking with, you know, the big, the bigger foundations nationally um, about supporting uh, the scale that we, we intend, which is a hundred cities and a million people in the next five to 10 years. That's our goal. Each one of these, by the way, is led locally. I mean, we're the backbone and supporter, the community practice, um, help people manage the design, monitor, evaluation, and learning. But really, it's uh, each one is its own state registered C corporation, intentionally led by the community members themselves, just like we did it. Great, thanks, John. Um, and I put a call in the chat there. If uh, there's any responses from funders and investors on on that question, um, I'm not sure if you can actually raise your hand so you know. Uh, raise your hand in the chat in some function, we can uh, unmute you to hop in. Um, on this note though, uh, Delilah just asked a question there about essentially non-philanthropic investors. I'm wondering if either of you have seen any interest from, uh, yeah, banks, pension funds, insurance companies um, and the like. Um, John, I'll start with you and then Adriana, and then we can move to uh, some of the community investment pieces that I think folks are curious about. Yeah, I think the key for us with respect to banks is, is to provide that direct pay letter credit, which is tricky. I mean, we're asking banks to provide basically a contingent liability to support the investors. And there isn't CRA credit for it. Our bank considers that they do because it's in a distressed census tract. Um, but there's certainly some opportunity to, to build a link deposit fund that we're working on now to backstop to a certain extent the risk that banks are in take, you know, taking by providing that that basically form of a guarantee. Um, pension funds and those kind of people invest in these and the base, I think it's it's probably not the right source given their fiduciary oversight with, with them, but um, impact investors are interested in this, um, particularly depending on the impact investment source. You know, some of them want a certain social return, but they also want the financial return. I think we both, are in a position to deliver that, uh, but it's better to have that money um, with some flexibility and not above four percent in our mind. Otherwise, it's, it's you know it's tough to make the math and capitalization work without grant capital at the bottom of the capital stack. Yeah, so we 
currently do not accept or take, I shouldn't say accept, we don't, we haven't taken bank or CDFI debt at this time, uh, primarily because of the terms. Uh, so the KCT is very much so bringing online assets that have been offline for some of them decades. And so it, it's not going to take a two or three year loan to bring back the investment that has been missing for decades in a neighborhood. And so we can't take on those type of terms. Uh, we also can't take on debt. I would say probably beyond like 3%. Maybe we could go four. We haven't explored that high, frankly. Uh, because we need to mix it with the subsidy and we need to be able to ensure affordability on the back end, right? So if I bring an asset back online, but folks can't afford to live there or folks can't afford to have their business there, I've done nothing um, but waste somebody's capital and our time and energy. So uh, we need to ensure that. And so having low interest rates and that patient capital is what allows that to occur. We have done our financial modeling long-term and have identified that we will be able to take on debt up to 7%, but likely not until about the six to eight year mark, um, at which time we'll have a larger portfolio base and some assets that are already uh, generating revenue. Thanks, Adriana. Thanks, John. Um, I want to jump to the topic of risk because um, there's kind of uh, two, two threads here. Um, I think Clark and now Bill have um, brought it up specifically um, in, in projects, especially with CIT where there's community investors, um, there's a lot of conversation about how do you protect their investments. So I guess for John, I'm curious, um, what are the mechanisms to, uh, to doing that? And then for both of you, I think there's this idea also of de-risking investments so other investors can come in. Um, this is this question from Bill in the chat here. Um, so especially with re respect to the community investment piece, but also um, even in that absence, I'm wondering how you were thinking about balancing risk uh, based on who can bear uh, to, to take on that risk. Yeah, that was the foundation from which we could do what we're doing is to de-risk it and provide 100% liquidity for our investors. I mean, we legally had to do it that way um, to get this 3A2 exemption, a 1933 exemption that nobody had used. Um, it's an interest state, so it can be applied everywhere um, in the country, that exemption from registration, but we had to provide complete downside risk protection. And that's through the direct pay letter of, of credit with the bank. Um, now, when we're coaching other cities on a capital stack, see, we had the benefit and we were forced to be patient that we bought the building and didn't put it into community ownership because we didn't have the legal path set for three years. During that time, we could build the value of the building, get it leased up and, and increase the value such that we could get room under our loan to value with the bank of 70% to put the letter credit in place as it escalates. So we started at a 100,000 for the first year. It's at 500,000 now. So if all of our investors um, cashed out today, um, it would hit that direct pay letter of credit for 500,000 and the bank would have a loan of, you know, what it is now, roughly 800,000 plus 500,000. And, uh, you know, the building's worth 2.1. So we have room on value. Um, we'd coach cities though, to look at, at some grant capital at the base um, that's, you know, from a foundation that really can make the transaction work. And it's compelling, I think, for the foundations now to see that their investment is going directly, um, ultimately into people's pockets over time as they stick with the investment. The investors themselves stick with the investment. So de-risking for us has looked like bringing people to the table who understand the work and having them share the message on our behalf. Uh, and as I was putting in the chat, primarily because it's been exhausting, uh, I'm doing pitches to potential funders and investors an insane amount of times per week, like a, an erratically insane amount of times per week for the last 16, 17 months now. And we, in terms of commitments and dollars that we've received, have not even hit 5 million yet. So uh, and it's really not that big of a lift. Like it shouldn't be that big of a lift, right? This is a neighborhood that has very clear opportunity for the social impact. The financial returns are there, albeit low and patient required, but there are returns and the ability to innovate and to build something that is responsive to a neighborhood and its needs is there. So it does all of the things that folks say they want to do. And again, we're just having trouble. So we've been spending a lot of time doing that. Um, most recently, I think some of the folks on the call I'm seeing um, some repeat folks, but most recently we had a conversation with the Ford Foundation 
the Katali Foundation and Springpoint Partners, three of our current um, investors and supporters, some with pending investments uh, in the form of term sheets and some with investments already made, just to have a national conversation with philanthropy. Like it was literally a call out to every national small family foundation, anybody who has money in their back pocket to invest to say like, these foundations are on board. These foundations understand the importance of this model and have um, you know, made it through their de-risking challenges, if you will, are willing to share due diligence, are willing to have peer-to-peer -peer conversations on our behalf so that we can move this forward. Um, and I think we're just gonna have to continue to do a lot of that. Like peer-to-peer -peer engagement has been critical for us to bring dollars towards this model because that's, it's just been the, the best de-risking tactic, uh, tactic for us so far. Thanks, both of you. Um, we have just a few minutes left, so I'm just going to ask one final question and then have about a minute from each of you to, to answer it. Um, on this uh, much brought up topic of, of furthering this work in other places, so replicating um, or in some cases scaling to you know, new buildings in the neighborhood, um, do you have any kind of takeaway on that in terms of what would be helpful or how you view it that uh, folks should walk away with? last point here. I'll start with John and go back to Adriana. We've learned a lot in working with, with these cities um, and CDCs or CDFIs um, or a coalition. It's been different in every city. Um, and, and that's been fascinating to see how the diversity of, of entities and project focuses um, can fit with, with the CIT model. Uh, so in other words, some, some cities are, are looking, Omaha in particular, um, is looking at rehabbing an old school. Um, and other cities doing the, doing the same thing as well. And then some are looking at kind of a necklace of, of smaller properties to put into a CIT, um, just given the configuration of, of, their, of, their, uh, of their commercial retail properties. Uh, but I think some of the central themes are you know engaging the community early and not getting stuck there with the sticky note you know ongoing conversation, but to but to put some action into the community and I think it activates the community so fast much more quickly when they're investors and then they become more involved in supporting the range of other things that are attendant and important from meeting space, convening space, art space, um, affordable housing, co-op space, a range of things that are that are all I think compatible. So we really try to position ourselves um, in these cities as being a supporter and catalyst and compatible um, entity, not the only answer. Yeah, for us, so, you know, not like John, but similar to John, uh, we are getting approached by communities and neighborhoods across the US all the time about the model. Like, how did it get built? How does the legal back end work? How are you taking investments? What types of properties are you acquiring? How are you prioritizing? You know, governance questions. And for us, it's been, we've been both very transparent in saying that this is very difficult work. This is a big lift, right? Like this is not something that's born overnight it is something that has to be deeply intentional. And it is something that has to center the neighborhood. And if you can't do that, don't pick this work up because you're gonna have a hell of a time both trying to fund it and implement it. And so for us, you know, what we decided fairly early on, and I would say we've really strengthened our commitment to it over the last year, is that we will be evergreening out all of our research, all of our model building, everything around how this was built so that other neighborhoods don't have as hard of a time doing this, right? We've paid tens of thousands of dollars for research that we know is a burden and that we know other neighborhoods aren't going to be able to pick up and lift that, those funds to do this, particularly when we're saying that it should come directly from the folks that are impacted by this work. Um, so if you're interested in just like learning more about how this was built and, and how to think through it, um, I would suggest subscribing to our e-newsletter. We don't ever send out e-newsletters, so that's the disclosure. So when you see an email, you know that it has content in it. Um, so you could do that at the bottom of our website. Uh, and we don't send out e-newsletters because we don't have capacity. We're a team of two. It's, it was me up until about like three weeks ago. So uh, literally don't send out newsletters. But the other thing I would just say is continue to be in the rooms where you're hearing about different models because not every model is a good fit for every neighborhood, right? Like just because there are shared common themes and issues doesn't mean that we can just transplant these things around. And so just, you know, there's the Guild in Atlanta, there's East Bay Prec, there's us, there's CIT, there's Trust Neighborhoods. 
There's so many different models that are being born and we're all so similar to each other, but there's these distinct differences that are responsive to that market, that are responsive to that neighborhood need. And so just really be informed about what's out there and what's available and don't be afraid to innovate, right? Like build new things um, and just try to take some best learnings from other models when you can. Amazing. Thanks, Adriana. And thanks, John. Um, yeah, it looks like we're going to have to wrap up this discussion. I know there's so much more that we could really be covering here, but um, just want to appreciate all of y'all and uh, the folks in the room for uh, you know, keeping this conversation going uh, with these great questions. We're definitely going to be able to share out um, all the resources that were shared uh, in the chat here, as well as some other things that I can direct you to the websites of Adriana and John, um, and also just um, some other uh, readings that might be uh, relevant to this conversation. Um, so I'll kick it over to Andrea to, to wrap us up. I just want to say thank you, Kurt, for leading this uh, discussion for us. Thank you, John and Adriana, for your generosity in joining us and sharing all your learnings. Um, best of luck with your work. For anybody who enjoyed today's discussion, we will get the recording soon, and we will have the next one on August 25th where we will be flipping back again to the, uh, the enterprise financing. So we'll look at community capital funds, and how they can be used to build power with Deborah Fries from the Boston Impact Initiative that you all are familiar with, and Janice Fine from uh, uh, NC3, the National Coalition of Community Capital. So that looks like it'll be another great conversation. Thank you all for joining. We look forward to seeing you on the 25th. Remember, you need to sign up in advance. All the best. Thank you again, Kurt, John, and Adriana.